Hi, this is Kevin Trainer. Welcome to my lecture on Chapter 4 of uh, Interaction Design 4th uh, Edition. And Chapter 4 is called Social Interaction. Um, so, uh, the last uh, chapter, uh, we were talking about cognition, the cognitive aspects of things. And now we're talking about the social aspects of things. And it occurs to me, because I'm doing the lectures on the same day, that uh, whereas I, d I think uh, the research and the models in the last chapter are uh, pretty long-standing and fairly well settled, uh, I think really the opposite is true here. Um, in a lot of ways, we're trying to capture, um, we're trying to get at interaction design principles that are going to work for uh, social applications. Uh, and uh, social applications are pretty new, right? Uh, so what's uh, kind of interesting is there's research around, there's theory around, there are models around, and we're going to talk about them. But we're probably going to expect more change in this area than in the last one. So we're going to talk about uh, some of the details of how we are when we're social with each other in face-to-face -face conversations, in remote conversations, uh, what we mean by telepresence and what we mean by co-presence, and then we're going to talk about a couple of shareable technologies. So... Um, <clears throat> You know, we don't have to, uh, uh, unless we're, say, linguists who are worried about the rules of conversation every day, uh, we, don't, we don't really think about the rules of conversation that much. It, it just kind of happens. Um, although, as soon as we start thinking that we want to build some kind of uh, computer-assisted interaction around conversation, then we start to have to look at what are the elements of conversation and uh, how does it work? So, um, uh, what we have here is an example of a, uh, a conversation between three people. Uh, hi there. Oh, hi. Hi. All right. How's it going? Fine. How are you? Okay. So, so. How's life treating you? Now, um, if, in fact, we were three people, A, B, and C, and we were all in a room and we were face-to-face, -face, well, we might hear all those things, and that would be pretty straightforward. Um, if, in fact, we were in a chat room, okay, and we're seeing this come across the chat, I think we could maybe follow this uh, pretty well, too. The fact is that the rules of uh, talking in a chat room are maybe a little different than the rules of uh, uh, talking in person. For instance, um, uh, when people come into a chat room, they typically come in with their high all. Um, and it's usually not considered rude just to uh, pump that in, right? Uh, Whereas uh, if you walk up on a conversation that's in progress uh, physically, you generally are expected to kind of stand there until there's an opening for you. And maybe somebody says hello to you and kind of recognizes you as a speaker. So there are differences between um, the rules and conventions of conversation in person and uh, online. And those are uh, kind of interesting to the interaction designer. Um, now, uh, here's some thoughts that really have to do with uh, how uh, social applications are affecting our, our life. Uh, are your face-to-face -face conversations being superseded by our social media interactions? Uh, several years ago, I would have said uh, no. You know, and uh, I went from somebody who is not involved in social media at all to a person who was uh, involved in social media because uh, it was uh, 
a professional interest uh, to somebody who got a little more involved and now uh, I'm sort of addicted, I think. Uh, the recent uh, presidential election uh, here in the U.S. has gotten uh, a lot of us people uh, talking uh, political things on uh, Facebook. And oddly enough, uh, some of the original people in the networks that we're part of are uh, kind of put upon that we want to talk about political things and not only pictures of our grandkids and... Uh, um, Oh, sort of cute animal videos. Okay, so it's sort of interesting. Um, there is a, a big uh, kind of intersection between uh, real life and uh, online life, and they uh, keep uh, kind of interrupting each other. So uh, I, I know I'm seeing a lot of overlap. Um, um, and are the established rules of etiquette still applicable to online and offline? I think they are, but they're different. One of the things that I realized is that if uh, uh, my cousins um, are uh, not of the same uh, political persuasion as me, and yet they're my Facebook friends. And probably if we went to a uh, we went to a party, and I talk politics as much at the party as I do on Facebook, I would definitely be considered rude. So how much I'm allowed to talk about my political beliefs on Facebook now? I don't know. I I think I think I'm getting them angry. So uh, some of this uh, territory is is unmapped, and it's kind of fun to discover. <clears throat> we have had a, a considerable research done about how uh, conversations in the face to face uh, typically work, um, and here's a here's a three rule system that's pretty good. Rule one: the current speaker chooses the next speaker by asking an opinion, a question, or a request. Rule two, another person decides to start speaking. Rule three, the current speaker continues uh, talking. And this is a kind of a hierarchical set of rules. Uh, one uh, so, sort of is uh, stronger than two is uh, stronger than uh, three. And why would we need that? Well, uh, it, there are times when uh, I guess we might want to be uh, trying to create an artificial intelligence kind of application. Okay, and so we might want to know what the rules of conversation are because we might want to create some kind of bot, right? And we'd want the bot to seem uh, kind of human and we would want it to be uh, cognizant of the rules of conversation so that it could uh, it could play human, right? Um, or we might want to create all kinds of online social interactions in, in which kind of understanding the normal social rules of conversation um, could inform at least the starting point that we take in our uh, design. Um, turn-taking is a big aspect of uh, conversation and um, turn-taking uh, creates a lot of context. So we've got two people here, A and B, shall we meet at A, um, can we meet a little bit later, uh, shall we meet at A, wow, look at him, uh, yes, what a funny hairdo, um, can we meet a bit later? So. There's a lot of, uh, it's kind of, one of one of the interesting things is that uh, there's kind of, uh, typically, at least, even if it's kind of one-sided, there's this, this attempt at uh, creating a kind of conversational transaction which uh, uh, persists, however um, interrupted it might be until it uh, gets resolved. 
Um, there are more uh, rules to uh, the conversation. Uh, uh, you know, we might say bye then, see you, bye bye. Um, it, 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 interestingly, uh, again, in chat, and I spent a lot of time in chat because we always have chat in my online classes. Uh, luckily, these days, it's beside the, of, you know, the voice of things. But people tend to say, uh, people tend to say, uh, bye all, or good night, or thank you, or those kind of things. But they tend to say just uh, one thing, whereas uh, rules for leaving the room in person are a little different. Certainly people who you're close to, you might say bye to individually. So it's, it's a... Uh, it's kind of interesting to think about what the rules are and all this uh, kind of stuff. Um, if in fact you can see each other, you can uh, you can uh, put together some cues that it might be time to break up. You see people looking at their watch or starting to fidget or doing that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> Uh, another thing that happens in conversations is that they break down, okay? Um, some of the ones that we've seen so far are pretty much everybody's on cue, everything's going well. Uh, we have seen someone, uh, we have seen a recent example where maybe there were some interruptions and some uh, distractions. But we can also have the problem where we don't uh, really communicate with each other. Um, uh, so something's misunderstood and, uh, one person says this one and then the other one says, no, I meant that one, uh, those kinds of things. So, uh, typically we, you know, we banter back and forth until we, we agree. It's maybe easiest done in person and then, uh, a little easier, uh, a little less easy on, on the phone, probably harder yet in something like uh, chat. So, uh, you know, the question is, uh, for the interaction designer, if in fact we are trying to uh, design some social interaction that's going to happen with, uh, that's going to be mediated by information uh, technology, what are the rules? Are they the same? Do the same rules apply? And I think I've been saying, uh, no, they don't. They're slightly different. Uh, are there more breakdowns? Yeah, I think the less immediate the medium, the more breakdowns there are. Um, and uh, how do people re recover from or repair the breakdowns. Um, the way that we uh, recover from breakdowns on the phone, for instance, is not terribly different from in person. Although uh, email might be different. Um, instant messaging or texting um, uh, can be different because, again, there's that sort of immediacy of the response. Uh, that's possible. Uh, Skyping, is it a video Skype or just an audio Skype? For instance, could we show somebody, oh, no, 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 I met this person here. Here's a picture to remember them, right? So uh, the media are different. Um, the time frame uh, shifts, and so uh, the rules are going to be different. And the effectiveness of various uh, strategies is going to be uh, different depending upon the circumstances. Um, there's been quite a bit of research on how to, how to support conversations when people at at a, a distance from each other. Uh, Many applications have been uh, developed and we've used them, uh, email, video conferencing, video phones, IM, chat rooms. Um, do they mimic or move uh, beyond the existing ways of conversing? 
Well, I think they do a little of both. Um, one of the things, uh, I talked a little bit about chat rooms, and um, I've been teaching long enough in uh, graduate school uh, that uh, one of the programs I teach on, uh, when we started, uh, we had the communication work like that. We have a synchronous uh, session in which I, the instructor, would get to talk like this. And the students uh, typically would get to reply via chat. Um, and that worked reasonably well, but we came up with this idea that we wanted the students to be able to speak for them to get headsets too. We had the bandwidth for it. And um, we found out a couple of things. One is uh, that a lot of the students who had loved the chat didn't really like to turn on their mic and talk that much. So we had uh, quite, a, quite a challenging time getting students who were in the program continuously. Uh, they tend to roll over. Uh, but uh, students who had started with chat were reluctant to use their microphone up until they graduated. The, the, the students who uh, started with the microphone still like the chat for some things. Uh, so we still use the chat even though we have the microphone. And um, one of the things that people like chat for in uh, classrooms, and they like it on conference calls, um, is to chat in the back channel. So um, whereas uh, in a physical classroom or in a physical conference room, uh, two people who are participants uh, putting their heads together and whispering to each other, it's considered rude. Um, for two participants in, in a class or in a, uh, a conference to be uh, chatting to each other on a, a chat application at the same time, uh, it certainly doesn't uh, detract from the experience that others are having. They might be more distracted, you could argue that. But you see people exploiting these, uh, these uh, back channels quite a bit. And I know in some organizations, it's just uh, kind of assumed that if you're on a conference call, there's going to be stuff that's going on in the main channel and stuff going on in the back channel. And that's just the way things work at that place. So here are some of the devices um, that are possible. Uh, the one that I, I love is the video phone that we see on the left here. Uh, this one was by uh, British uh, Telecom, but certainly people I I in the U.S. had uh, similar things created by people like Western Electric. And the thing is, it, is that there was a lot of talk about these kinds of capabilities, and they didn't have a lot of uptake. Um, compare that with the situation on the right, where we see... Um, we see, you know, kind of early uh, cell phone video, um, and this even seems kind of quaint uh, now. More typically, you'd expect to see two people um, sort of on their Apple iPhones doing FaceTime or... Uh, doing their Android equivalent of that. And that's just uh, kind of common stuff. So, you know, uh, there was a lot of talk when we had uh, uh, products on the left that people were really going to prefer to have this kind of communication. And it didn't come, and it didn't come, and it didn't come. And then, boom, all of a sudden, uh, the price point and uh, the use cases emerged. And now... Uh, video calling um, has quite a following. People don't use it for all their communications, but uh, they use it for uh, quite a few. Um, <clears throat> Bellcor, which is another one of these uh, Bell System research companies back in 1989, uh, put together a demonstration uh, a project uh, 
which was a video window system. I think we have a picture of it. Uh, oh, okay, so here's a sketch of it. They just took uh, rooms at two facilities um, and they uh, created a, essentially a bank of screens such that it appeared that the people on the other side of the screen were, screen were either in the same room or an adjacent room. And they, they just saw how people behaved. You know, they put it, uh, you can see there we've got uh, coffee and cupcakes or uh, muffins there. And we're, you know, we're just going to shoot the breeze. And oddly enough, the, they got a lot of uh, people uh, naturally interacting as though they were pretty much in the same room. Um, having to raise their voice uh, sometime or uh, talking about the 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 experience uh because it was so uh, novel but the fact is that they had pretty typical conversations um so uh let's see a couple of the findings one is that people constantly talked about the system um they spoke more to other people in the same room uh, rather than to people in the other room. Uh, that could be a proximity thing. It's hard to, hard to tell. Um, when tried to get closer to someone in the other place that had the opposite e e e e e e effect because you went out of range of the camera and the microphone. So you had to, you had to sort of learn the personal uh space and intimacy kind of uh uh, uh, uh dynamics of the of the medium but uh it's a pretty cool experiment skype's a big deal uh i know that i've been using it for well since the early days um and uh uh it's uh well it was uh, so successful they sold it to microsoft so how good's that um here we're talking about video skyping so that we have not only uh audio but uh, video too um seeing other people on the screen enables more intimacy than just audio alone uh enables people to get to know each other better um, apparently, a lot of people think it's less awkward for uh, children. You see, you see people, um, oh, grandparents interacting with their grandkids, uh, children interacting with their parents when their parents are on the road, that kind of stuff. It seems to really appeal to children and grandparents and parents alike. Um, and... Um, so it's pretty popular stuff. It's also very popular for job interviews. These are, are situations where um, you perhaps just can't get as much information as you want out of the audio channel. And uh, bringing the video on allows you to see much more, many more cues um, and have uh, maybe a fuller ability to evaluate your uh, compatibility um, on top of that we have uh, uh, we have some uh, uh, games and worlds that people are participating in um, we have uh, 3d virtual worlds like second life which has been around for uh, looks about uh, 10 years with over 8 million users um we have people in these environments that are uh having fantasy experiences i guess you could say we have people in these environments that are having normal interactions that just happen to be happening in these uh these kind of uh virtual worlds um so there's all kinds of possibilities there um and then you've got the idea of uh 
this uh, voice over IP over IP versus uh, chat room talk. This again is a big uh, a big issue um, in the courses I teach online at the University of Illinois, where we have synchronous uh, sessions. So the question is, are we going to use the chat or are we going to use our microphone? And um, um, I was a person who thought, well, we would always use the microphone, that it was just richer. But the fact is, it hasn't turned out that way. There's still still a, a desire for uh, chat. And there's a lot, of, a lot of aspects of this. One is that everybody talking at the same time isn't rude on chat. Okay, so you don't have to wait. So if I pose a question to the class, um, and people have a lot of uh, ideas. They tend to chat back their first thoughts. I've had a lot of luck with saying, uh, Mary, uh, can you turn your mic and kind of, uh, kind of explain what you were thinking there or kind of, uh, kind of amplify that? And I've, I've had a lot of luck with uh, uh, trying to mix the two in a, in a pretty effective uh, way, but it's uh, definitely true for my classes in this, on that uh, platform, that um, the fact that uh, voice over IP is a, is a richer uh, medium, it doesn't mean that it's always the preferred one. Facebook and Twitter. Um, take up entirely too much of my time that it could be just uh, my stage of development as a social media being um, everyone uses them uh, well not everyone does but quite a few people do um, people use them in different ways um, What's kind of interesting is it just to look at some of the, the uh, dynamics. Um, there are some people who lurk on uh, both, so they don't really post anything at all. I, I was a lurker on both for a long time. Um, there are some people who will post things that they think that other people might want to see, and then they might like things or favorite things in the Twitter sense. Um, there are some people who will uh, comment on things. And, I, and as soon as you begin to comment on things, you have a conversation going. Uh, Twitter seems to be uh, harder to get a conversation going, although uh, uh, my problems in doing that, I think, have more to do with my hoot-sweet uh, client than they do have to do with the medium overall. But um, um, it's... On my client, it's hard to see some kind of conversation going back and forth. And uh, I have most of my conversations on Facebook and most and in the things on Twitter are more uh, uh, proclamations. Although I do see people having conversations on uh, Twitter. Um, certainly, uh, Twitter has become uh, very newsworthy now because... Uh, the current uh, president, uh, when he was a candidate and when he was the president-elect and now in his early days of the presidency, um, seems to uh, want to use the medium um, uh, over and over again. Uh, some people think that's good. Some people think that's bad. But it's brought a whole new attention to Twitter that I think it didn't have uh, before. Um so I think that's, I think that's been good for information scientists, uh, just because the conversation, the discussion has, has arisen. Uh, uh, what is the medium appropriate for, and uh, for what kind of people in what circumstances? So, I think that's a, you know, yeah, uh, well, it's a fun conversation to have as an information scientist. Um, we want to talk about telepresence here. So telepresence is a, a jargony uh, word 
that we're using to, to describe new technologies that are designed to allow a person to feel as if they were present in the other location. Um, so it's not only communicating with people at the other end, but it's it's being it's getting that feeling for uh, the parties that they are together. So you have to create some kind of illusion with that. Um, how could you do that? Well, you might be projecting their body movements, actions, voice, uh, facial expressions to the other location, to another person, to a robot, to a screen. Um, or perhaps we might superimpose, superimpose images of the other person in our workspace. And I've, I've had some work with that. I've had, I've been part of these. Um, I had a really good experience in teaching a class last summer where we had a camera system in our classroom that was uh, smart. So when a person began to talk, it would it would uh, it would aim the camera at them and it did it pretty reliably so we had uh, some situations where we had one or more people in another location uh, who were able to interact with the people in my classroom and we could see them on our uh, projection screen and they could see us and the behavior of this who was going to be focused on and who you could hear was actually pretty good and we adapted uh, pretty quickly so it was like it was kind of like all being in the same room not precisely but uh, it was pretty cool uh some of the products to do this um uh, uh one uh, demonstration uh product uh hyper mirror uh, from 98, so that's getting pretty old, nearly 20 years ago, allows people to feel as if they're in the same virtual place, even though they're in f physically different spaces. Uh, so it appears we're all looking in the mirror uh, together when we're not. We're in different places. So that's an interesting idea. Um... And here's a couple of more pictures of how it works. Uh, and the experience with this uh, picture on slide uh, 21 is that, you know, we're all there together and we're all happy. Okay, perhaps not perfect, but it's kind of interesting. By reality is another... Uh, a prototypical system um, that uh, allows uh, people to interact with a uh, sort of a robot. We see this uh, kind of cart down at the bottom that's got a multifaceted uh, uh, screen on top and it's got cameras and uh, microphones. So people are interacting with the uh, bot and um, uh, they're being uh, communicated with by the person at the uh, the other end. Okay, uh, so lots of possibilities there. Uh, this is one I think we saw a little bit more of on TV, although I, I haven't seen it in a while. It was pretty popular. This is from 2014, so it was probably pretty popular back then. You had these little uh, robots where you'd have, you know, the uh, the motion stuff in the bottom and then a stock and then a screen on the top with a camera. And so um, here's a bot attending a conference. Um, and so the people who want to interact with the, with the remote uh, person can... Uh, look at the screen so they know what the remote person is uh, saying and doing and then of course when you're looking at the screen you're usually in range of the camera and the microphone so pretty cool stuff uh here's a telepresence room okay uh this particular one from cisco systems 
Uh, and this isn't all that unlike the uh, the classroom that I told you about, which I think might have also been from Cisco, uh, where uh, we've got uh, two screens that are being used for um, uh, communicating. Uh, let's just assume the, the two screens on the right are two different groups of people who we're conferencing with. And uh, probably the camera and the microphones are automatically switched uh, such that whoever is uh, currently talking um, uh, gets on camera. Which works, of course, if we all don't talk at the same time. Um, <clears throat> how much realism um, is needed to make uh, telepresence uh, compelling? Uh, well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, the, the classroom experience th that I had uh, didn't take us uh, very long uh, before we were behaving as though we were a little bit uncomfortably in the same room. So um, uh, it didn't take a lot of realism to do it. Um, uh, the robot version? Well... Sometimes the robot uh, itself can be more of a distraction than a help. Okay, is it just as you is good to use uh, Skype as uh, the you know telepresence like we just saw? Sorry. Uh, well, I think it is if you only have a couple of people interacting. As soon as you get a larger group of people interacting, um, you get to the problem that you can't both see and hear people. So. Some of this uh, telepresence app stuff, uh, I think, can really pay off when it performs well and uh, the performers know how to, uh, how to work the medium. Um, another kind of a social, uh, social mediation mechanism that can happen uh, in a computer assisted way is uh, various forms of coordination. So here we're talking about coordination mechanisms. Um, so when a group of people act or interact, they, they need to coordinate themselves. So maybe you're playing football, maybe you're navigating a ship, who knows what they're doing, okay? Uh, perhaps you're, you're out having fun with your friends. Okay, you're going to bars, all right? Uh, the kinds of things that they use to coordinate verbal and nonverbal communication in the face-to-face, -face, schedules, rules, and conventions, shared external representations. Um, so how can we do this? Well, there, there are a whole lot of applications uh, these days that are playing off of our smartphones uh, knowing where we are, okay? Uh, so uh, they can tell us, uh, I, I know for instance that uh, my wife has an application that reminds her when she's close to a store where she's put some stuff in that she wants to get some stuff with. And it does actually remind her in a way that she'll go, oh, I can go to Costco. And she drives in. Um, we know that there are uh, social applications that give us uh, give us opportunities to, to meet people who are close to us. Uh, perhaps that's not always good for the public health, but there are those applications, and some people are getting a lot of enjoyment from them. Uh, so there are all kinds of opportunities that are coming for us to coordinate our interactions and get invited to interactions that we might otherwise miss. Um, so whereas I don't think we have a lot of research on, on these yet, uh, we certainly have a lot of good, uh, uh, we certainly have a lot of good anecdotes. So uh, the research, I guess, will follow. Uh, Co-presence is a cool thing. This is a way to have uh, people typically located in the same place 
interacting with some object or some system that we're expecting it to enhance their experience. Um, either when they're working or they're learning or they're socializing. So some examples would be smart boards, surfaces, we and connect. Uh, the idea here is that uh, we could create a richer opportunity for interaction than we would have just face to face. Uh, either by uh, giving us knowledge that we wouldn't otherwise have, um, having it, uh, having it, it, it may be changing around the social rules or cues. There, there are all kinds of possibilities uh, here. So this uh, general area is being called co-presence. Um, face-to-face -face coordinating mechanism. Um, so a talk is the typical way that we coordinate face-to-face. Nonverbal communication is uh, used uh, to emphasize what we're saying as, or as some kind of substitute. Uh, in formal uh, meetings, sometimes we have explicit structures such as agendas, memos, minutes, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, uh, now we're really getting to this uh, awareness stuff, and I, uh, I kind of hinted at that a few slides ago. Uh, this is the idea that, that we can become aware of uh, what and who is around us and what is happening. And this is, uh, this is I think, hot because it creates such uh, commercial opportunities. Okay, so many of these, um, so many of these interaction mechanisms are interesting. Uh, but it's hard to hard to know how you're going to get them to pay for themselves. Whereas this uh, awareness that comes from, uh, for instance, our smartphones always being able to know where we are and then take that and coordinate it with some kind of a centralized application and appropriate information sharing. And then we can know uh, what opportunities are around us. And again, that's... Uh, that's a pretty, um, there's a lot of people who think that's pretty promising in terms of uh, telling people places they can eat, places they can shop, um, places where they can stop and get a drink. All uh, commercial opportunities. Um, now, uh, you know, people have been creating awareness uh, systems uh, for years, okay? Uh, typically in offices, well, it depends on the kind of office you have, but there are some offices where you have to account your, for yourself whether you're there or not. And you're expected to uh, take something like this little spinner that we see here. And if you're not there, then people can, you know, can figure out... Uh, where you are or how to deal with that. Um, so there is a non-digital, um, there is an analog, low-tech awareness mechanism. Well, we can do the same things uh, on our smartphone. So how would we design uh, technologies to support this awareness opportunity? Um, so we would want to provide awareness of others who are in different locations. Uh, so those are opportunities that we wouldn't get at all because uh, we wouldn't see them without, the, without our solution. Um, we can create workspace awareness, which is up to the moment understanding of another person's interaction with a shared workspace. Um, there's just a lot of possibilities. Two examples that they're talking about here, and they talked about in the text, I believe, is a React table and Reflect table. 
So the React Table experience, uh, here are two girls interacting with the React Table experience, which looks pretty good. So uh, not only can the people interact with each other, um, they can interact with objects, and then the objects can interact with the table, uh, and the people can interact with the table. So lots of possibilities there. And the Reflect Table. Uh, similar kind of uh, situation there. So the fact is that we don't know what's going to work uh, here. I mean, we know what traditionally we've done in interpersonal interaction. We do know we have quite a bit of history with the telephone, with email, with chat, uh, with uh, things like that. But the fact is that we're still inventing these these modes of uh, of interaction and um, this is a pretty exciting area pretty exciting indeed and and one that I think is going to attract a lot of research um, to the point where we're going to get uh, uh, theories and models uh, to help the interaction uh, designer along. So this is a space that you're going to want to continue to watch. Here is another one, the Dynamo system. Uh, notification systems. Users notify others as opposed to being constantly monitored provide information about shared objects and progress of collaborative tasks. Uh, an app equivalent of this is uh, Babel. So this is uh, perhaps less intrusive, right? OK, so you can probably decide when you want to notify. So this, is, uh, this isn't only a monitoring thing. This is more uh, publishing and subscribing. So in terms of privacy, it has definite advantages. In terms of being, uh, um, in terms of having up to the minute most reliable information, uh, probably not as good as a monitoring system, but uh, perhaps a good uh, compromise. So Coco, show who is where. And who is meeting with whom? OK. Now, in, in some offices, I mean, I've worked in some offices where people are trying to interact so intensely all day long that they spend a lot of time just thrashing about trying to find each other to speak. Remember, I, when I was working in uh, consulting, when we were in the office, we were forever trying to work out some deal, come up with some ideas. Having this kind of a system would have been great. It would have been like, oh, he's in Sandy's office. Uh, or, you know, you'd look in Sandy's office. Well, it's just Sandy there. OK. Y you know, you get the lay of the land. Uh, for a lot of people, this would just be tremendously intrusive. Um, for instance, in a, a, a psychiatrist's office, this would be downright uh, uh, well, this would be a bad idea now, wouldn't it? Uh, so uh, the promise of these kinds of applications uh, has to do with really finding the use case for it. There might there'll be use cases in which these kinds of things will just be absolutely great, and and then the rest of life where this will be seen as a a, a, a horrible. Uh, perhaps well-intentioned intrusion. So what's next? Well, who knows? Besides perpetual sharing and broadcasting of information, knowledge, and personal content, which we seem to be doing now, well, life logging, recording everything in one's life and sharing it. We already have some people who are doing some things pretty close to that. Micro chatting, even beyond uh, Twitter and Snapchat. Fact is, we don't know. the The technology can support a whole lot. The question is, what are the use cases? 
what problems and opportunities do people have that uh, that uh, solutions could address? And I'm going to say that it's probably at least as important or not more important to understand the problems and opportunity that our users are having than uh, being as completely up to date on what the various implementation alternatives are. Um, I think being a technology in search of a use case is a pretty bad place to be. I think that being a person who understands the family of use cases and users who is uh, keeping up to date with technology and finding ways to match them up, I think that's a, well, that's a sweet spot. And that's where I, I would like to be. And I, I would hope that's where you would like to be too. So a little summary, uh, social mechanisms like turn-taking, conversations, etc., enable us to collaborate and coordinate our activities, keeping aware of what others are doing and letting others know what you are doing are important aspects of a collaborative working and socializing. And many technology systems have been built to support telepresence and co-presence. Um, so again, uh, I think I'll make the comment again that I made in the beginning. Uh, here we are at, at chapter four, where um, uh, we're talking about the social aspect of, of things. And um, it, it's all pretty new. It's, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we know, but, um, and there's research and there are theories and there are models, but not nearly so many as we saw with cognition. And I think, I think this is a, a ripe area for researchers and practitioners and uh, this is uh, this is a typical thing where you say watch this space and I'm going to leave you there until next time bye bye